We welcome Travis Black to the show. What's good? <laughs> it's good morning. It's always one where these microphones you kind of want to go, good morning. Yes, yes. How was your weekend? Oh gosh, it seems like a long time ago. Because as you know, we've got uh, a little baby like yourself. And so sometimes those weekends feel a lot longer because you get evening hours. And so hours that you, you didn't get to experience before, you get to enjoy. And so there's a blessing to that. Um, and sometimes uh, it's a little bit more tired on Monday mornings. What did you uh, What did you do? Did you hang out with family? We did. My boys, I've got a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and mm -hmm. so we've been hitting the bike trail. Oh. And so that's been a lot of fun. My two-year-old rides in the back, so he feels like it's his chariot, and he can ban me to do as he wills. <laughs> and so some of it's a teaching moment to let him know. Hitting yeah. you with the stick? <laughs> that's a stick? You're not Faster. a star. <laughs> but what do you need? <laughs> All right. where, do you, where do you guys bike around here? We usually head close to um, my son's school, so at College Hills, and so we'll go around that playground. So he kind of gets to, now that's his domain, and so he gets to lead his brother around his stomping ground and show him the ropes in and out, and so that's a lot of fun. You're taking me back because that's where I went to elementary really? school. Yeah. That's a pretty cool place. 30 years ago, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite superpower? Yeah. You know what? I was actually going to flip the interview just in the beginning because I, I was wondering, let's get your opinion. I was thinking about superpowers on like, why do you think in this cultural moment that superpowers are all over the place in movies and television? Like what about now makes that resonate with our cultural moment? Do you think? Two reasons. One is because we finally have the technology to show superpowers cinematically <laughs> in a way that's going to hold up <laughs> yeah. over time. And we can, with, you know, modern CG, we can animate anything you want. Yeah. Finally. And the, the, so that's one reason. The other reason is because, and this is all just my opinion, but obviously, but the other reason, a friend of mine wrote a movie about 20 years ago and in that movie, he described the superhero process as he used it as an allegory for being gay. Interesting. And yes, and and but more broadly for feeling a sense of not belonging. Okay. And I think in modern society, we are as we've we and many others have discussed kind of ad nauseum we are more connected than we ever have been and yet somehow less connected yeah. than we ever have been. But more, more to the point, I think superherodom and superhero movies are about this sense of how do I relate to people who are not quite like me hmm. and how can we all feel this sense of community with each other and how can I take responsibility for the gifts that I've been given to make a difference for people who have not been given those gifts and superhero movies and superhero stories capture all of that. Yeah. And so we've kicked around the idea of discovering superheroes as a theme for this show. And we've yeah. never officially branded that way, but we've always built it around talking about what desires or abilities make you unique. What would you want to be able to do and how would you use that to help others or, or to help yourself? Yeah. So what yeah, is I like it? that. That makes uh. a lot of sense. Um, I think for me, it would be uh, more of a photographic memory. And so, yeah, if I could remember names and uh, particularly the unique details of people's stories um, and those moments like that they, they do that, where they reveal things that are going on. So you could come back to them years later and go, hey, remember when you said this, this, and this? How are things going? Um, and I think, so I could learn languages. And so it'd be nice to just absorb a lot of different languages. But I think that, I mean, that's something that people do have the ability. I think the superpower part of it would be the ability to minimize remembering or recalling the emotion associated with the memory of things that have been disappointing oh. or people that have done things that you didn't appreciate or things that you yourself did that you didn't, uh, that you don't want to recall. Cause I think that that's like oftentimes people who have photographic memories and you can imagine this with your, your wife, like when they say, you know, remember you tell me when you're, you're frustrated with me, tell me what I did. And if you were able to go, well, you did this, 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 and don't forget, you know, a year ago you did that. And with your family you did that. And you know, you can do 20 years 
of history and that you can grow rather bitter uh, if you remember that. And so if you could weight those down and then have the ability to look into this long line of your past and just to see all the different things that you're grateful for and the people's stories that you've interacted with, I think that would be pretty awesome. Yes. And there's, there's a religious element to that too, regardless of anyone's faith. Yeah, I happen to be Christian, but we welcome all faiths and creeds here on the show. And in the Bible, it talks about uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. And we are hearing more and more about the power of gratitude mm-hmm. in in developing a really strong sense of happiness. And I I believe it. I'm I'm a hundred percent bought in on the power of gratitude. Yes. And so learning to forgive people for the things that they've done that have hurt us is really a gift to us. And because that other person's not spending any time worrying about it in, yeah. in, mo- in most cases. Oh, yeah. And so the ability to say, I wish you hadn't done that, but we're all human. I make mistakes too. And I forgive you. That's, yeah. there's huge power in that. I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on the superhero discussion? Why do you think superheroes are so of the moment right now? Yeah, no, I don't. I like um, your theory in the sense that it does give us the ability to um, look at our unique individualness, the things that uniquely build us who we are, and to project that in a sense that that is some sort of extraordinary offering that we bring to the world. Um, I think it's also one. I mean, some of it's just the difficulty within films to find bad guys because of the political correctness. And so you Mm. need to get aliens and you have to upgrade the aliens power. And so you have to reduce, you know, increase the ability of superheroes to combat that power. And so some of it, um, you know, gone are the days where you can just make Russians, the bad guys or Chinese, the bad guys, (laughs) um, which they used to do all the time. But I do think that there is this, as you say, I think in our cultural narrative is that, there is so much coming at us so quickly that it is hard to piece those things together. And so these overarching narratives that guide our lives, I think there is that fragmentation that we have all these different aspects of our lives that we go to. And so we have our work and then we have our family and then we have our friends, but some of our friends are different because we have the friends that we live next to or the friends that we choose to live with or the friends that we acquire because of our kids. And so how we weave it all together in this very transient type of lifestyle that we live Mm to, it's nice just to have something big that uh, that we can look at and go, okay, everything's going to be okay um, in some way or another, um, even though it's probably not going to be because someone gets angry and turns into a big green monster. Um, but there will be something that comes up that helps us to navigate the complexities that I feel emotionally on the day to day. And you say something big in that we can sort of fit our story into this other narrative and say, Okay, this 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 makes it all make sense. Is that is that how you're is that how you're talking? Yeah, it all and together? I don't even know if it would be on that rational level because once you start talking about it, then it kind of sounds strange. You're like the Avengers are going to save us. Like, Wait, mm-hmm. no, they're not. But <laughs> there is that I think deep seated desire that something will arrive, and usually what it what it manifests is in some sort of technological innovation. I think that that's where we as a society have put a lot of our investment as providing the solution, and yes. so these really are technological enhancements of humankind to meet the challenges. Yeah. And so I think that it. some of that is what we're looking for. And and in a lot of ways we're producing. Um, and so, and that part of it's really exciting. As long as we, as these movies recognize, there's always an evil and there's always a good. And if we choose the good, that's here's, a challenge. Here's something else I think is fascinating about the superhero conversation is superhero movies are less black and white than they used to be. And I think public discourse is less black and white than it used to be. One of the greatest secret superpowers that I think people are developing now is the ability to say, I think you are 100% wrong about this particular issue. And that's okay. You're, you're all right. I'm okay. And you're okay. And I disagree with you on this, but we can disagree and we can still be friends. And I'm not going to cut you out of my life. Just be like the, the whole, the whole unfollow if you mention Trump, but like people still do that kind of thing. And because we're all squished right next to each other now, you may feel like people are more inclined to do something like that. And it may be indeed happening more often, 
but I think people are learning this other this this kind of new way of relating to each other, which is to say it's all right when we disagree. It's all right when you make different choices than I do. You may do something that I'm really I that is not my way, but you know what? It's your way and that's all right. You may support someone that I am not into politically or even religiously and that's okay too. I'm interested to know why you made the decisions that you did. And really what I want to know is how you thought about it. What what were the ways that you connected the dots? And unless there was something, you know, sociopathic in how you made your own decision, um, I can be okay with a lot of different stuff. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I would, I, there are things that are not included in that, you know, um, Nazism or, uh, or, um, you know, murder, anarchy, that, that, that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm not really, not really into obviously, but but I think we're gr- growing comfortable with a lot of different life approaches and perspectives that are not our own. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because like, I think that on a microcosm, and I think probably more in an academic environment, like a and you'd have some of those conversations. But it's been strange because I, I grew up in Texas mm-hmm. and then I exited for 16 years and then came back to the United States. And I feel as though those conversations are a lot more polarized than they ever were before. Sure. And so it's interesting to think of it, even from political, what you say, because I think at a city level on those relationships, there is a lot more recognition because of the exposure to so many different points of view. Mm-hmm. So you can go, oh, okay, there's probably something I'm not seeing and let me get to that point. But then once it gets larger and larger in the aggregate at the state level or the national level, then I feel like it gets more polarized. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And I think we are seeing the the mistake we may have made as a country in really moving into a bipartisan system because the problem with structuring everything around primaries in a bipartisan system is in order to be nominated for a general election, you have to be close to the middle of your own party as opposed to close to the middle in general. Yeah. And so what that means is you have you have these you have polarization in the primary process. You have candidates being pulled away from each other, the successful ones anyway. And then, and then you get toward the general election and you have a fight. And, yeah. um, and really it's the election cycle has been pretty, has been pretty well stepped out. Almost every president in my lifetime has been reelected, has served an eight year term. And then, the power has flipped over to the other party for eight years. Um, so we'll see what happens, but yeah, it just um, what was interesting to me is that there is a coalition coalition of mayors and I love that they're getting together to say how we can lead the change nationally mm. because kind of what you're saying is the mayors have to deal with all the unique particularities of their context and mm-hmm. all these different people and all their different beliefs and all their different needs and all the different desires and putting those together and so these mayors are getting together and beginning to form policy on how you can do that at a national level, because oftentimes that gets distanced um, once you get larger. And so it's exciting because I think even for those listening, that city government is a critical um, pathway forward, because if you can work out the diversity in the local level, then it provides a picture of a pathway forward that uh, I think can gain a lot of momentum beyond just sound bites, um, but actual participation. Here's an interesting question. I think it's much more important to vote in municipal elections than it is in, to vote in national elections because just being realistic, the odds that you're that a single vote is going to matter in a national election are infinitesimal, but in a municipal election your vote might actually make a difference. And yet we vote I feel like we vote in national elections more as a form of self-expression than anything else. And it's really more of a, you like proudly wear your stripes in terms of, uh, you know, what side are you on? Uh, And and why was that important to you? Going back to what we were talking about earlier, in terms of your own philosophy, how do you frame your decision to vote for, you know, Liz Warren or uh, Pete Buttigieg or, or Donald Trump? why did you choose that and and i think more and more we are embracing the conversation of it even if 
you know, you made a decision that I did not agree with. Uh, knowing who you voted for does tell me a little bit about you and then understanding the why behind that. I, f- I find voting to be this fascinating exercise. Yes. It's crazy. No, I think you're right. That uh, Plus just the local getting involved in that, even the awareness of it um, gives you a context of what the problems really are. Because oftentimes it's the small problems. Like how do we fix streets or how do we feed children who don't have enough to go through their day at school? Yeah. Or how do we um, just distribute the resources that have been gathered? That stuff really does matter. Um, and it you'll see an impact right away. And it, you, again, you can affect the change. Sure. And especially in a community like this one, because we are still at the size where our, our long-term destiny as a city is kind of TBD. Yeah, it's kinda true. TBD. So we'll see what our, what our legacy becomes. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, more about you. Give us 60 seconds on your road to maze. You started to, you started yes. to talk a little bit about it so earlier. So I grew up in West Texas um, in Abilene, and then I did my undergrad at A&M. Yeah. So I made it to the promised land early, <laughs> um, but uh, had to exit. So I did it in reverse order, um, is then I went to Egypt right after that. And so instead of going to Egypt to the promised land, went from the promised land to Egypt. <laughs> And so, uh, and I spent four years there and I was working at an international church, um, about 1800 people from yeah. all around the world. And it was a key moment and fascinating too, because the, the reason that I got to Egypt was because I met a yell leader at Mosher Circle randomly. Mm. And then we became friends through this conversation that, which I love about a you just kind of run into people and become friends. Yeah. And it was through a connection through him that I found out about this internship. And so... Um, it was an internship that turned into a full-time role. And so that was the big thing for me because this West Texas and kind of Texas culture to being exposed to to all the cultures in the world. And we had people from every single continent except Antarctica um, represented there. And you realized real quickly that that what you thought was obvious is not obvious to everybody. And what you thought was conviction is oftentimes just a reinforced opinion. And so having to to be able to step outside of yourself and to really listen was so critical for me. Um, and so it asked a lot of questions. And then after that, I went to Vancouver, Washington. Um, a great thing in Egypt is I met my wife there. And so yes. we always said I went a really long way to meet a girl from Georgia. <laughs> and so it was wonderful. We dated and then went and got married, did our master's of uh, theology at uh, Regent College in Vancouver. And then I went and pastored a church in New Zealand. And so it was another international church. A lot of refugee populations had moved into this, one of the most diverse slivers of the city in the world. Um, and so I got to lead that church for three years. And then- um, One of these days you'll get out of your comfort zone, Travis. <laughs> I know, exactly. That's what, uh, we had our first uh, son there. And then the, the Congratulations. plan family felt uh, pretty long. And so we made it back. I went to, back to my hometown for a couple of years to save money to go to school and then have been doing the MBA. And so that's kind of the, the circle back, beginning and ending in the promised land. You mentioned the convictions that you came to question. What were those? Well, yeah, it's, it's all of those. I think, first of all, the self-awareness is always difficult. Um, I think it requires... It being exposed to people who are different and that usually is those who've been exposed to a different culture and so because that's hmm. you know we absorb culture it's something that sure do. we don't get to um, critically evaluate as we input into our lives or mm-hmm. history is another one of those and so really Egypt provided both it provided this long history of a civilization to be able to go why um, and how yeah. um, and then with uh, all these different points of view. And, and just to give you one example, it was interesting because there was a, an American who had opened a coffee shop where I was in um, Egypt. And so I asked him, what is the biggest problem that you have as a business owner in Egypt? And he said, paying my employees too much. And I said, sorry, you must have meant not enough, right? <laughs> so yeah. you, you switched the end there. He goes, no, no, paying too much is they know exactly what they need to sustain their family life. And as soon as they get that, they won't show up to work. Huh. And so, and that's one of those mind blowing things we go, but when they just want more, 
And so that's why I had to question, what is enough? Um, and is there something beautiful in finding enough and being okay with that? I mean, obviously there needs to be commitments to your employee that you keep or your employer that you keep, but I think that was a, a beautiful one. And even their distribution system is primarily through family relationships. And so at the, the store, usually it's their uncle who brought it, you know, delivered it from their great uncle who was growing it. And right. so these network of relationships that weren't just transactional, but, um, were personal and there was something beautiful in that. Uh, it, inefficient in times too. Sure. So there's always a trade-off, but to be able to see what those trade-offs are were a lot more helpful because then you could recognize where the spectrum you were on a decision instead of just assuming there's one way. Then what was your conclusion about th that employer-employee relationship where the person, once they have enough, they stop showing up. So the employer's response is, to say, okay, I'm going to pay you exactly enough then. Is there a better way to do that? Or is that fine? That's some, I mean, it is fine because it's how they're functioning and it seems to work, but is that is that non-optimal in some way? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thinking about legacy, for example, thinking about providing for future generations. Yeah. Would you change something about that if you could? Yeah, I mean, because I think it's, there's probably so many different forces that go into that. And so, cause there'd be an education or a, a lack of educational infrastructure in Egypt that provides some of those things, yeah. um, certain family obligations that are there. But I think some of it, the solution that he chose, which I think was a good one, is that you still need a consistency of your workforce to be able to provide service to stay around. Yeah. And so that requires you to come in at a regular basis, particularly for a coffee shop, which is a, a relational entity. Yeah. And so, um, but how can you make that a family environment. And so instead of just being a transactional as an owner, say, you come here, I'll pay you this, and you provide this service, he really did care about the people that he was uh, employing. And so their family became an extension of his family. And so I think he showed some of that financial expansion to their lifestyle in different ways than a wage. And so it'd be more through gifts or showing um, different appreciations oh, to their employees. And I, I like that part of it. And, th and they're probably, I mean, there's probably some more sophisticated ways it could be done, um, but it was just an interesting challenge to witness. And I didn't, it's, it'd be interesting to go back kind of more with the business lens now to, to think through it. Um, at that point, I was just kind of shocked <laughs> going, oh, okay, yeah, so some people, you know, find enough and maybe that's a really great place to find. Yeah, yeah, it is. How many were in your family growing up? So I, my mom and dad, um, and then I have a, I'm the oldest and then it's a good thing to be. Yes. So the, the king in charge, <laughs> um, and then I've got a brother that's two years younger. He's in film. So he's right now in Japan. Oh, they're shooting a snake eyes movie, a new GI Joe movie. Um, and so he's having to negotiate on the production side of that. So he's, he's got a fascinating life. I'm sure. And then my sister is, uh, I had a sister, so she was six years younger and they're about to move to Corpus Christi. And so her husband's going to be taking over, or he's going to be working at the Goodwill there. Uh huh. So, what was your very first job? My first job was working at my dad's law firm. And so, my dad is a third generation attorney. Um, and so, his great grandfather was the so Supreme Court justice in Texas. Oh. And then he worked with his dad's uh, law firm. So, I was going to be the fourth generation law firm. So, this is to be able to to a fourth generation lawyer. So I was going to cut my teeth. And so I remember going in and that first week I worked the whole summer, but most of it was just shuffling around papers and storing papers that had been generated by the content that lawyers did. And so it was that summer that I knew I would never be a lawyer. What was your greatest challenge as a child? I think, uh, child wise, it was great. And so my parents were incredibly supportive, um, and one of those that they were always there when we needed, which is an incredible gift. Um, I think probably middle school is one of those that those insecurities get uh, heightened. Mm -hmm. And so I remember at sixth grade, uh, I had to sing a solo in front of the entire sixth grade class. Yeah. And so it was me. And then I had the background singers, which were all um, girls at that point. And so I came in and my voice at that point was incredibly high. And so when I came in and sang that, it was a Corella DeVille 
Uh, then they did the background and they came in, I think, almost an octave lower. <laughs> and so at that point, um, when people would see me, they'd be like, hi, Corella. Uh, and so that's where you're kind of like this heart wrenching, what am I questioning your very existence? Um, but luckily, those things smooth over and uh, are good. But it's those things, that, it's interesting to look back on why that, that moment always comes to me and going, what does that mean? Um, but it's good to, I think, overcome any sort of tribulation, even minor as that. And because it makes you sensitive to those things that probably no one thought of. You know, I thought it was the biggest thing in my life and that everyone had it printed on their mind that uh, this guy's voice was abnormally too high. And probably everyone's voice was high at that point anyways, and uh, no one cared about it. And so how to shuffle off the things that don't matter, even though they still grip you. Years later. They do. As as a boy, and this is probably true for girls too, but one of, one of the toughest things is growing. if you grow late, that's a really hard thing to deal with. And uh, I, I can say that from experience. And after, um, you know, everybody else's voice has changed. Everybody else has, you know, started turning into young men and you're kind of hanging out saying all right all right let's go let's go let's go let's go we got a we got a big day except for me it was let's go let's go (laughs) exactly right (laughs) uh yeah that's a a, it's a very hard thing you feel very less than you talked about what your dad did What, what did your mom do so my mom growing up um she was with us raising us and then as we went to school then she was a librarian um and then was a grant administrator and now runs the marketing um, of a hospital. And it's been amazing. I think I, I admire my mom a lot, both my parents. Um, but it's interesting because I just thought mom is mom and that vocationally that her job was to serve us and, uh, <laughs> and didn't realize that she gave up a lot of her vocational aspirations, I think, to do that. And she never made it seem like it was a sacrifice. But to watch her in this last role, um, to go in a really strong corporate environment, and she took it over... Um, when it was a pretty toxic relational uh, team that she had. And so Mm. it uh, it just had a rough space before her. And to watch her come in there and to build up those who worked under her, that I think felt um, fragile at that point. And to develop talent where there's a cohesiveness there that is generating a lot of positive um, work for the hospital has been really impressive. And so I, I, I wouldn't have seen that before. And so to, to look at what she, in a sense, gave up at the talent that she brings, but still to be uh, someone to admire, just the way that she loves people on all part of the organization and is able to, to bring them together for a common purpose. What do you think her greatest talent is? Why, is? why has she been able to do that in a situation where it seemed very difficult to pull that off? I, she doesn't, Ego doesn't get in her way. And so that's such a big step. And so she doesn't need to feel as though people think that she's important. Um, And so from that, the second thing is that she values everyone equally. And so you, you walk through the hospital with her and it takes forever because you're stopping with saying hello to a doctor, to a janitor, to someone who prepares food, to someone else in the administration office, because she knows all their names and their stories. And so when people feel cared for, they'll follow you. And I think that's why they follow her joyfully. Mm. Yeah, leadership is really about service. It's incredible. I want to talk about the two years that you were saving money to (laughs) embark on your next journey. It seems like the the way you said it earlier made it sound like you kind of knew what you wanted to do next, but is is that in fact the case? It was it was some of that, and so the change from New Zealand was. Um, I mean, it's always drastic because you're you're moving internationally, coming back into a context um, that is very familiar because it's what you grew up, but now very unfamiliar right. because you've been exposed to all these different ways of thinking. And so you're not more reflexive and reflective on the environment that's going in. So I think I was trying to figure out what the next path was because the pastoral path, I'd climbed that, but realized I, I wanted to climb somewhere different mm-hmm. um, for good reasons, um, which we can talk about. But um, it was interesting to go, okay, let's regroup, reorient. And then, um, yes, then business school was always in the back of my mind at that point. Mm. 
Yes, let's talk about why you wanted to leave the pastoral path. That's that's a good discussion. Yeah, <laughs> it, um, it was it, New Zealand was it's such a gift, and I think pastoral ministry is a gift um, that's still represented in a lot of different roles vocationally too. I think doctors um, have something similar where you're invited into the sacred space of people's lives. Uh-huh. And so I, I really appreciated that. Yeah, bedside manner is a thing for doctors and sometimes pastors as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> except pastors, they expect you to be Jesus. And so the bars <laughs> risen a little bit. <laughs> right. But uh, the, it kind of culminated in one particular event um, in New Zealand is that there was a, a Fijian Indian who had lived in the outskirts of our neighborhood. And so he had come into our opportunity shop. And so we had a secondhand store that was next to the church that sold things. And so he came in and started shopping there. And the the leader of that opportunity shop just had a gift of pulling people in. And so suddenly this guy who was coming to buy clothes was suddenly folding clothes and putting them out as, as a worker volunteering. And so he came a part of this relationship and uh, of this church. And then I got to know him. And so he came to visit me one um one morning and uh, sat in my office and my office had this window and it looked over the the back of this hill that declined into some of the a couple of houses that the church rented out and it was it was awful and so there was trash in the sill it was overgrown it was just it was really ugly okay and i remember him looking over and he's like can i um garden that and so i, I looked at it and it was kind of the first time that i registered that it was a place um that existed and could be utilized for something beyond just, um, you know, plugging my view. And right. so I said, yes, you know, w- what do you need? And so there were some other people in our church that got behind him and uh, some resources that got allocated. And I watched the transformation of this polluted plot of land um, become tiered off and then start growing vegetation and then fruit trees were planted. And then on Sunday morning, suddenly boxes of vegetables and fruits showed up for people to to take home with them. Uh. And so the development of that, and I think that that's that's where I go. This is am- amazing. And so yeah. having the skill set to be able to come around someone who sees a polluted plot and transforms it into a life giving um, place is something that's scalable and transformational. And so what would it look like then to develop the needed skill sets to do that? Because once you start doing it logistically, uh, it gets complicated. You're like, now how do I get this produce to where it needs to go? And so you've got supply chain issues. You go, now, how do I know if it's profitable? Like, can we make this work if we begin to scale it up? And of course, that's a, a finance decision. And then how do we get the word out so that people know that there's an alternative buying place for their their neighborhood fruits and vegetables instead of going to this gigantic chain. And of course, that's a marketing issue. So it's all these different skills that I saw that I didn't have that place, that I would love to have been able to take that space and to magnify its impact that led me into to business school. Because there's still, there was kind of a ceiling that I felt within ministry, though it's still powerful and necessary and something I have a, a huge amount of respect and love for. But I wanted more of a scalable solution that could could address a lot of the ills that I saw in Egypt and in New Zealand that often had to do with a stability that's needed for people vocationally and financially before they're able to, to deal with the deeper things of life. You came to business school to make you a better minister. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I love that. Love it, love it, love it. Any, any funny stories that came out of your transition, your your psychological transition, or even from the early days that you spent in other countries. We're always interested to hear people's fun stories from being elsewhere, culture shock, anything like that. Oh man, there's so much. Uh, like I, the great thing about Egypt is it is, I feel like whatever you could m- use your imagination to create on a humor level they will trump with reality. Uh, nice. <laughs> and so even the things that like watching someone with a motorcycle and have their wife who is feeding their child on the back with all sorts of suitcases packed up at the back of it. And you're, it, it's crazy, but there's right. something you're just going, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those, you would never have done that, but I love 
seeing that or like the taxi ride where you're you're driving along and suddenly the carpet falls under and you realize that there's a little hole in the floor. And so you see some of these things and it, it makes it sound like Egypt is um, a place that uh, has some pitiful conditions and it's not. What is amazing about it is they are just so um, ingenious on taking what they have and utilizing it in a way forward. And so it looks humorous and sometimes because um, it's out of the ordinary, but once you start zooming in and seeing just the creativity that comes in conditions that are less than ideal to continue to get by. And so that's what I love. It was always a mixture of that humor and awe simultaneously. It sounds like a lot of team players in Egypt. You were instrumental in writing your class's culture code for the MBA program. Why did that matter to you? I think, I mean, a lot of it was with my experiences. The churches um, are still, I think, kind of looping back to the beginning of our conversation and this in continually fragmented society where we're oftentimes in our tribal um, areas most of the time. Mm -hmm. Church is one of those few places that you still have the overlap socioeconomically and ethnically in our case. The Depends on the church. That's true. Um, and in New Zealand, when you're 5% of the population, it's a lot more common because you feel outnumbered. And so that is a way that brings people together. Yeah. Uh, but that culture is so critical because you have all these different desires and different needs and they have to be channeled in a specific direction. And so to cast how we're going to do that was necessary. So to, to go to that place and then to come into to business school where I'm surrounded by incredibly intelligent and talented future leaders mm -hmm. who will be uh, leading hundreds, if not thousands of people under them in the future, you kind of go, what is the potential that we can reach as a group? And so I think that's what was the main inspiration or draw emotionally to go, okay, what is it that we need to be able to get to the place that we can be um, so that we don't waste this rare opportunity to be gathered as this type of group before we're spread out? Mm -hmm. What... Procedurally, what are the most obvious landmines in the process of writing a culture code? Yeah, um, starting. Oh. <laughs> so um, I think it's always... Before you, how many people were on the, the committee for this? Well, it, Shannon kind of throws us out in the, the, the sharks. And so she basically says, hey, come up with a culture code. Um, we're leaving you got a couple hours. And so it's- The whole class. The whole class is oh, there. okay. And so then you have to figure it out. And so it was interesting to watch because it's always a consolidation at first because again, everyone has a different aim or objective of what they think is needed. And yeah. so um, I just listened to a lot of people as they articulated things wonderfully and then began to kind of, to capture that in, in words. And so, so were you the note taker? I wasn't a note taker, but I was just trying to, to bring it all together. Um, some of that, because you can sense part of it, and this is always, I think, within culture codes or anytime you're developing something, part of the people just wanted to leave. You know, it's like, oh. let's get done. Yeah. Um, uh, it's the end of a long day of a very intense week. I just want to go relax. Yeah. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to first year. <laughs> yeah. And so, but uh, then of course, there's other people who are very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And so... Mine was just trying to kind of accelerate the process by capturing what has been said and doing it in a way most efficiently. And so after there'd been a number of people who talked, then I just kind of put it together in words um, and a couple of bullet points and then presented that, um, which I think resonated with people because it was just a rearticulation of what they they said a lot. And then we needed to nuance it. And so those who were interested, and there were 12 of us then who got through and we, we nuanced uh, a lot of our five different um, culture codes that we had, which was great because we had to flesh out and weigh and prioritize. And so that's where more of the rigorous debate happened, um, which was good. And then I think got to a product that was something that captured our class's desires and still pressed it just a little bit more. So there was something to strive for. What was the most revolutionary thing in your culture code? Like if, if you had to point to one thing that you, that you makes you say, I'm glad we got that in there, or I'm not even sure I am glad we got that in there, but it's <laughs> certainly something that made me think. Yeah, no, my, my favorite one is still the celebrate diversity 
Okay. And so, um, and that was because we we crafted it saying this. We said we chose to move beyond tolerating, acknowledging, and even understanding our diversity. We seek to champion and to celebrate the difference that we each bring. And so, I think it kind of goes through the different stages of diversity that's there. Is that first ag- acknowledging that that's there is a big key, and so that not, that everyone has a different experience. And so sometimes it's easy to forget that mm-hmm. if you're a part of the dominant culture. But then you can just tolerate that. And so we can go, okay, what do you need to be happy? And what do I need to be happy? Um, And that wasn't enough uh, for me, even moving to understanding that. And so that's where you can go, okay, there's these different ethnic uh, values that are enculturated. And so we honor that and we understand that, or there are different personality types that you come and you bring. And so we get all those differences that are there. Um, And so it's moving beyond that too, being able to just articulate what is different to do you understand the person enough to be able to celebrate what that difference brings? Mm. And so it was interesting within our class because we have such incredible diversity. And so we have an Egyptian there who was who marched against um, the government when they had the big riots in Egypt. He was there on the front lines yeah. trying to get a new government for his future. Or we have- Possibly on a motorcycle with suitcases <laughs> piled up <laughs> on the exactly back of it. Right. <laughs> I know. Oh, man. And so, I mean, phenomenal. Because um, I knew exactly where Tahir Square was because, of course, we we had to get our visas there and it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And that was that's monumental um, to learn from that. Or even someone from India who- came to the program and they had their first baby while she was away. So he had to wait three months to see her. And then now she'll be almost a year before they get to live together. And so that kind of perseverance and commitment to do that, or even someone from Nigeria, who's part of our class, who um, came over from Nigeria and now uh, is a part of the U.S. military. And if there is any sort of biological warfare that hits in a city, then he has got two hours to be in Houston on a plane and he will be the front line in mm. defense of that. Someone from Nigeria wow. coming to a country that's not his own and defending that country. Yeah. And so you look across all these unique stories in our class and to get to the place that you understand the depth of that story, able to celebrate the uniqueness that brings, that's when we as a class will be able to learn and grow the most because it's the, the difference that people have that allows me to become better because it allows me to see and to do things then differently than I would have done. So I think that's what, what I'm most most proud of. I'm looking at your uh, I'm looking at your sheet over there and I see the words collaborative excellence. Can you describe that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so that one is where we we the definition of success we wanted to shift from an individual to a group metric. And so measured how? Well, uh, th- however we feel like we can get ahead at that time. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think in our sense, a lot of it is already embedded within the program, which is good. And so a lot of that is that we get a lot of our grades as groups. And so some of that accelerates that. But I think what we were thinking too, as we kind of um, hash this out, is the hiring process. Because that's one of the most stressful things is you're coming in here, you're getting a whole lot of information really quickly. And then you're having to try and find a career and learning how to interview well, how to do your resume, and then getting out there and um, figuring out what you want to do. And so that part of it is to measure the collective success of our group. So we as a group haven't been successful until every person has a job that they they desire, they want. And Mm. so I think that's been really helpful to see my class do a great job of helping people out to find that out. And so when you're done with the job search, you aren't done. You're just now helping to reallocate some of those resources to help other people. To others. How do you hold yourselves accountable for that? Or is, or is it kind of this, or is it kind of an informal process? Yeah, I think it's more of, again, it's- Because I love this. Yeah, it's But more it seems that, like the implementation could be pretty straightforward in some cases and in other cases it might drift into a little difficult. Yes. And that would be, it, it could be more refined and defined. And so at this point, it's more of an aspiration that is shared by many. Yeah. And so it's just something, again, that captures more of the desire of the class um, and then is is reinforced as people continue to do that. And so I think that's always the difficulty with the culture code, particularly for an MBA class is because it sits within two larger cultures, the culture of the 
um, the program, the MBA program that has its history, and then the culture of Mays Business School, which sits inside the culture of AM. And so there's other things that are defining priorities. And so if we had the time and the length of uh, being together was uh, longer, then I think it'd be interesting to see how do you begin to put habits around all of these different things. Right. I'm sure that would be true. When has it been most challenging to uphold your culture code? Whether you're talking diversity, whether you're talking collaborative excellence or some other aspect of it. Yes. I see have fun on there too. That might be challenging <laughs> at times, especially in the first year. I feel like, yes, the, the fun, our class has done a great job. And it's interesting to see each class and their different unique cultures and how they have fun. Um, but sometimes there's there's a lot of pressure that builds in the compression of the program yeah. that the fun valve will always flip over and sometimes. And so that's not, it doesn't take a lot of energy or discipline to do that. Um, I think for us, the, the difficulty is always time. It's always margin. And so um, anytime that you feel you have less um, time than you have to get things done, you'll always default to, to take care of yourself. And so that's always, that's a tough part. That's sure. definitely present. The other thing was interesting, our, one of the other culture codes was change the world. And so it's it to couch all of these different things, the celebrate diversity, continue improvement, collaborative excellence, and having fun as a way to say that we're here to do more than just take care of our families and ourselves and to increase our net worth. But we are being armed as agents for change. And so, but the change the world part of it, I realize is really difficult because you, you don't know where to start. And so sometimes you get so overwhelmed by the amount of things that can be changed that inactivity is what results from it. And so I think I would have wished there that we would have been more of, you know, change the world one chain at a time. And so to recognize that there's these different chains that connect to whatever social ailments there are, what's the one chain or the, 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 few chains in that link that we can focus on and make that our intentional effort. And I think that would have helped to galvanize some support in a particular area where I think it's just one where it became a noble aspiration that didn't get a lot of feet to it because we didn't know how to do it. Well, because you're at the Cheesecake Factory. You see the 37-page yes. <laughs> menu and you're like, I don't even know what I want to order. I know. <laughs> Throughout your MBA, when have you felt most engaged, alive, excited? All of it's been wonderful because a lot of it is... Like every class you're going, oh, that would have been so helpful to know, or, oh, that's why I did that wrong, or that's why I got that result. But I've enjoyed the capstone because at the end of the program, then you have this capstone project that kind of pulls it all together. And I've been able to work with a mango farm in Peru. And so it was an Aggie who had gone there uh, to do work um, in Peru for social causes and then started this mango farm. And the idea was to utilize it as a way to uh, generate revenue that provides stability for a small uh, seaside uh, production farming community that were losing all of their kids to Lima, to the big city. Yeah. And so how can we make this a sustainable place? And um, was was doing great in aspiration, but hard in the implementation side of things. And so it's just been difficult to become profitable. And so we've got to look at that project to propose plans forward on how, how they can become profitable in the future um, and then they can use those proceeds to to develop the the community as they they see. But it's it's just great because you get to employ all of these different business concepts in a way that makes a social change, and learning some really fascinating things. Like getting a mango at the grocery store is miraculous, <laughs> particularly at this time of year because ninety percent of the fresh produce is coming in by ship right now in the grocery store in these mm. winter months. Peru, of course, is entering into their their summer months. But for a mango, you've got to get that mango. You've got to dunk it in 125 degree Fahrenheit water for 75 minutes to make sure that all of the, the larva fruit flies are gone. Huh. And then it gets on a boat, it's locked into it, goes through customs, gets inspected, and then gets parceled out to all the different grocery stores that need it on that ongoing continuous basis, um, which is awesome. And so those things that you take for granted are um, are. are plentiful in the United States, but it's amazing to kind of look now and go, wow, like all this plenty that we have before us has gone through so many different hands and so many different lives to bring it to this time at this price in this season. So much stuff we take for granted. Yes. I, I stopped boiling my own mangoes years ago. <laughs>
You completed an internship at Amazon and are going back to work for them full time. What was the thing that took you most by surprise during your internship? Obviously, Amazon has an amazing reputation. There's been a ton of press, most of it good. And there's some other things floating around out there about taxes and so forth. But (laughs) overall, Amazon's reputation is sterling in the business community. What was the thing that surprised you the most um, about your time there? It was the amount of responsibility that they were willing to hand over. And so I I arrived and met with my manager and she basically said, "Um, listen, and this was the logistical side. And so AMZL is the delivery side of Amazon. And so in most of the big markets, big cities, um, Amazon delivers their own packages. And Mm -hmm. so I was a part of that team. And so I had to develop a forecast tool to be able to tell all these delivery stations across the nation how many packages to expect in two days time and so that they could adjust their labor necessary to adapt to that um, incoming volume i see and go and like that was it and so you're thinking of this that tool that will be utilized across the whole nation Mm -hmm. um, in a way that will adapt critical labor to make sure that we honor the customer promise for every single package that goes to that place. And I've got to do that. (laughs) And so- You're doing this all yourself? All myself. Say, go do it. And so I think that that was, that was, yeah, shocking um, that they would delegate that amount of responsibility, um, which I really enjoyed. I didn't enjoy that first couple of days because I was in a minor panic. (laughs) Like how in the world- I would have been too. But uh, the people around will start, helping out and you start figuring a way forward. And so you have to utilize all of your energy and all of your intelligence as all the time to keep moving forward. And I think that that's why they continue to move forward, especially because they've got a lot of smart people, a lot smarter than me doing the same thing. Well, I doubt that. A lot of smart people, I'm sure, but there aren't a lot of folks out there smarter than you. A lot of, once you get to a certain level, it's all kind of the same. Like there's there, you'll see people that have certain gifts that you're like, I, I can't do that. Nobody can do that. And that person can do that. That lady can do that. That guy can do that. Um, but, uh, but at a certain point, it's just like, eh, what, what difference does it make? <laughs> Amazon has a very strong culture code. A tour of Amazon's facility actually inspired Shannon, Dr. Shannon Deer, to create a culture code for the office and have the class do the same. My class did not do that. What aspect of Amazon's culture code resonates most with you? The, there's 14 leadership principles, which would be their culture code. Um, and it was a big draw for me to Amazon. Um, and so I had read the Everything Store, which is a great um, history of Amazon, mm-hmm. and saw those values as they were put into practice uh, throughout the book. And so I'd already had an affinity for it. I think particularly what was most comforting is their customer obsession and that's the key driver to the business. And so, because a lot of the things that you said, there's incredible amount of press on Amazon out. Uh, and a lot of that can be fear generated because a company that has a growing presence um, in our lives yeah. in so many different aspects of our lives. Sure. Uh, but what was encouraging is that it is grounded in being the best for the customer. And mm-hmm. that's not something that's just said. It is something that you have to validate in every step of every process. And uh, that is what drives that business. So if it doesn't benefit the customer, it doesn't get done. And so I love those those rails and those boundaries because I think um, all the nefarious possibilities that get dreamt of, um, that it, it's kept from that path because it's not gonna be a benefit to the customer. Mm. And so that was big. And then the second one is just bias for action. And I think that was the most um, enlightening to me is that, a lot of times you can get handicapped in thinking about something so much, particularly when it has huge financial ramifications that you never move or you move so slowly. Um, and then inevitably when you start it, things break because there's always things that you can't anticipate and their bias for action. Amazon is data driven. So they come up with persuasive theories on what should happen, but they don't linger there long. They move into action and they know something will break and then they'll just fix it once it, once it breaks. And so if they can continue to do that, that's why they move so quickly. And so I think coming from a nonprofit world where everything goes so slow, 
it was nice to say, okay, let's just run. Things are going to break. We're going to fail. But if we don't fail, then we won't know what we need to fix. Yeah. And let's let the implementation define our prioritization uh, yep. and the data as well. Be decisive. I'm going to say whatever I want on the air and Kyle's going to make it sound awesome. <laughs> and Julie's going to help us put it out in the world. It's going to be amazing. Dun, dun, dun. And no one will ever know <laughs> that I'm an idiot. <laughs> whatever. What preparation were you most grateful for as you settled into the internship? So for aspiring MBA students, you know, maybe current MBA students, what, what did you, what were you the most glad you had? The, the biggest like sweat brow mopper thing. You're like, man, I'm glad I did this. I spent some time with this already. Yes. I, I, two things. I think first of all, like just the business language, cause I didn't know any of this. I, I can mention MBA, not knowing any business lingo, some of the managerial stuff you deal with as you're managing people, but all the finance stuff and the supply chain stuff, all of them have really thick vocabularies. And so just the ability to have a language to interface with people who are talking about that mm -hmm. was huge. Um, and I think secondly is the pace. And so they, you know, they say it's an accelerated program because it is. Yes. And so you're running so fast all the time and you have to learn a massive amount of information very quickly and not mm. only learn it as just being able to articulate it back, but be able to absorb it and to utilize that to make business cases and more sophisticated um, observations about different business problems. And so you kind of acclimate to that pace and it becomes the new normal. And that was helpful because when I went to Amazon, uh, that pace just continued. It is the normal. And so being able to already be at that pace meant that I could just continue to, to carry on. And so that was really helpful just to have that schedule that the MBA provided um, just to get used to it, at least for the pace of, of Amazon. Yeah. To, to me, one of the, one of the best tools that you pick up in an MBA program or any, you know, any high pressure environment, but especially a high pressure academic environment is just learning how to learn. And the older you get, the more that it is about that. And it's about optimizing for, okay, what is my process actually? Like me, I'm a terrible lecture learner. As Shannon will tell you, she had to scold me for having my phone out in <laughs> class early on in the, uh, in the MBA process. And and to me, that it's it's always going to be a weakness. I don't do well with lectures. I don't even do well with online learning if it's just video watching until yep. I can engage with it, until I know, to me, it always has to start with a question. What is the problem that I'm trying to solve? Yep. And until I know that context for it, I like all the stuff you're saying to me on a video, I'm like, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. I just don't dial in until I can think of it from a from a doing perspective. It's kind of like you said, it's always about action. What action am I going to use this to take? Yeah. So learning how to learn, learning how you learn right. relative to others. And how to do it at an accelerated pace. Yeah. And that part of it, but it, which is, is going to be the way that business is. And so that part is really helpful. Yes. You have, as we discussed, a family. How has that impacted your time in the MBA program, in your internship, and now moving into a full-time position? How do you think things are different for you than they would be for a, a more a, a, an MBA student who doesn't have a family? I think um, it's, it's, like you said, from the learning styles, um, it's all about efficiency with family. And so it's putting up boundaries to protect them because mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that, that's my greatest fear is you come into an intense program or even a, an intense place like Amazon. And I don't want my boys um, and now my daughter to ever say we were neglected. Right. And that my dad chose their career over me. Um, but knowing what that balance is, is always really difficult because at the same time, it's, you can always give more time to your kids and yeah. so that is, has been tricky. And so I think it's just been defining the space that's sacred. And so 5, 5.30 to when my kids go down, 7.30, that's, uh, that's their time. Mm -hmm. And then Saturdays are their time. And so we don't do group meetings um, at in, in any time there, and I don't do, do work. And so that part is good. What it requires then me to do is to use the rest of my time efficiently to get done what yeah. I need to get done. Yeah. And so, um, and that's really helpful. So I think someone coming into the program without those responsibilities, some of it's dangerous because then there's a lot more free time and a lot more would be 
probably overstatement. A lot more is a relative. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a relative term. Yeah, it does seem. Um, but to make sure that you get the, those rhythms in so that you can utilize your time efficiently. Um, but it's still, it's a, it's a tough balance. And so I think it's now recalibrating because it's easy to focus on the kids and then making sure that I tend to the, the needs of my wife, who's been an incredible champion. And of course, I mean, they're doing this with me. So we are doing an MBA, rightly. Uh, said and so to watch her sacrifice on that and to to make sure we get a rhythm and still figuring that out which is just requires a lot of dialogue rapid fire most valuable failure when i was in egypt it was the first time i had five interns and i it was my first time to lead and to have my own team so i was so excited to show them what leadership looked like halfway in there i got a letter from them that said we don't like working for you and I realized uh, that it was because I was leading them how I like to be led and I wasn't attended to their unique personalities um, oh. and to give them the time. And so it was a good reminder number. It was, it was a great failure because hey, I learned that I'm not that great. <laughs> and so I always have to be attentive and continue to improve. But to realize that leadership is all about listening. It's listening to the unique personalities and needs and wants of those who you're leading and adapting accordingly. Okay. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? Um, this is going to be a fun one. Because <laughs> I have some, I, like just having talked with you for an hour, I have some, I have some conceptions. And you do? Maybe I, I want to hear about them. Okay. Um, you are, you are, you're very insightful, um, incredible analytical intellect. And um, I'd be I'd be interested to know what you think your biggest weakness is now. My biggest weakness is I individualize too early. Well, I have many weaknesses, as Kyle will be happy to tell you. One of my <laughs> business weakness, one of my biggest weaknesses from a business perspective is I tend to individualize too early. So when you said the thing you said a second ago, I wasn't considering their differences. I have the opposite problem. I consider their differences too early and then they don't think I'm being fair. Oh, interesting. So and the other problem, the other problem for me is I have a hard time relaxing. So, which is not usually a problem in the business world, but it can be a problem in my personal life. Sometimes my wife has to remind me, hey, chill out. <laughs> We're just here to like sit on a beach and <laughs> it's not get off your phone. Although there's sometimes a yep. little bit of that too, but it's really more you don't, I can see you thinking about like operations management for the, like the hut over there that makes the dirty bananas. <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> Love you, baby. You're the best. Uh, so, or start but, doing it at a larger scale. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's why we're sitting down here and not up there. Um, but uh, what do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? I think that some of it is. I, being able to articulate things because um, some of that is using the strength finders is like that futurist part of things in the input. So it's always learning and then being able to take that learning and to project it into a future picture yeah. that can motivate and inspire. Um, but like the energy to then continue to do that is always gets is difficult. Um, and so I think that people think that I've got an endless tank and I don't. Oh, and so oftentimes my ambition um, is, is much more than my energy. And so I need people to come in and provide the predictability. And so I think that that's what, even in leadership, that people will go, oh, I would love to work for him. It must be inspiring all the time. But then whenever that day-to-day, -day, I'm, I'm not that inspiring. And mm -hmm. so like, I, I like to listen to the story, but I'm much more of an introvert thinker. Um, and so I'll be thinking in that space away from the crowd. And then once I go and speak, then I'm present fully there, but I have a more difficult time being present in the moment at all times. And so hmm. my wife's teaching me a lot about that. Um, Cause there's a lot of beauty cause I can be a, 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 the next step for a person instead of just being there. And so that's something I have to continue to grow in and um, will probably be a lifelong journey. I'm sure it will be fascinating stuff. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? Um, you know, there was, um, I've been reading Completing Capitalism um, by Bruno Roche and it, I, it, he's from the Mars Corporation. So of course you've got, this is the corporation that makes M&Ms and Snickers, um, which is one of the largest private companies. And they're asking the question, 
how much profit is enough? And so mm-hmm. it kind of goes back to what I was talking about in yeah. Egypt. Yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting to see it in an American company at a large scale asking that question. And so they're driving these different um, capitals that they're talking about. Financial capital, which we have a whole lot of tools and measurements and whole industries built around. But what about natural capital, the the resources from the earth that we use, human capital, those the, the people that we employ, mm-hmm. and social capital, the city that we come into. Yep. And so how do you put measurements to account for that? So if you fire someone, then your income goes up because your costs go down and your shareholders go, yay, but someone absorbs that cost, right? It's usually yeah. the government around it and the taxpayers that do it or the family that now has to allocate resources through time to take care of that. And how do you account for that in a business so that you get a holistic perspective of what the business is actually doing in a larger context than just its immediate one? You're really talking about measuring externalities. Exactly. Effectively. Yes. Hmm. What's your fondest memory of TAMU? There's uh, two that strike. The first one is that we had a festival of food with my MBA class Mm. that they do. And so it's all the international students will bring their food and uh, we'll talk about the uniqueness of their country. And so that was one of my favorite nights, particularly because it was some of the best food. I mean, you just get all this spread of world cuisine in one place, which I love. But to see the excitement of people who have come a long journey and have been in a culture that's not their their own where every day they have to do things in a way that's different than they would naturally do it hmm. to get up with such beaming optimism and um, excitement to say this is my country and mm-hmm. i want to share with you what i think is unique i loved uh, the second thing is I got to be a part of an Aggie men's retreat um, this year as well. And so it was a lot of the people that had graduated with me in my undergrad who put this on and they invite Aggies who are presently in school. And so it's about 100, 150. And it's just a time for older Aggies to pour into younger Aggies. Mm. Um, and so you've got Yale leaders and former um, student body presidents. And so people who were incredibly successful at yeah. um, A&M developing the future. And I think that that represents the AM culture in so many ways. And so it was just wonderful to be able to look at the present and the past and see the bridge to uh, the two together to come up and to make people better. Beautiful. We close each session with good bull. Anyone you want to send good bull? Yes. Um, I know it's customary and it should be. Um, if my wife who's endured even watching three kids this morning um, for that is amazing. And so she's been an incredible gift. There's also one, uh, Gary McCaleb, and he got his master's here and his PhD in management from mm-hmm. Mays um, probably 40 years ago, maybe 40, 50. Um, he's a mentor of mine in Abilene. He's a vice president of ACU, teaching management. But what I love about him is that he's got this incredible depth of wisdom Mm -hmm. from reading and knowing all this business and um, whatever wisdom's out there. He was also the mayor of my town for 10 years. And so what he does is he, he bridges theory and practice. And so he takes what he knows, but he moves it into the messiness of city life to enhance the well-being of people there. So his saying is always, it's easy to talk about streets and sidewalks, it's a whole lot more difficult to talk about community because mm. community is a whole lot more difficult to measure. Yeah, it's and, nebulous. And it requires a whole lot more time, but it's those things that matter in the city. Safety, well-being, the ability to feel loved, all those things is what makes community. So if you can build the systems, the streets and the sidewalks and the commerce that comes around them that enhance those intangibles, that's when you have human flourishing. And so no I question. Get good bull to him oh, for, yeah. for demonstrating that. Well, even if you look at New York in the 1980s, 1990s, what made the one of the biggest differences in lowering the crime rate? Getting rid of graffiti. Yeah. Like it just just having this sense of this is a well organized place. This is a this this we we deal with disorder in a certain way and you are safe here. Um, that was a huge anyway. But I, I applaud that. Yeah. I applaud all of that. I would like to send good bull to my wife's sisters, Anna and Calissa Rydine. Um, We're going to see them for Thanksgiving. And of course, good bull to my daughter, Brielle. Daddy loves you. Travis, thanks for joining us. This is what a great real, conversation. Really fun. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your support. 
Drop us a like below and feel free to leave a comment if you wish. We appreciate positivity and constructive feedback. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on our latest episodes and bonus content. You can also take us on the road using your favorite podcast listening app. We have those linked below. If you'd like to know more about Mays Business School or our guests, visit mays.tamu.edu forward slash podcasts. Talk with you soon.